Uh, just another beautiful uh, New Mexico afternoon, and here we are back on the gypsum. And what a weird goddamn habitat it is. Just forms basically a crust. It's like uh, it's like drywall, kind of. You know? It's basically a uh, abiotic soil crust. So a soil crust that's not caused by any kind of lichen or cyanobacteria, etc., growing on the ground like you see in some habitats, but a crust that's just basically formed by the substrate, the chemical composition of the substrate that we're on. And it's calcium sulfate gypsum. And on gypsum, just like on California serpentine or sometimes on limestone, etc., you get a whole host of plants that have adapted to grow, uh, to tolerate the, both the soil chemistry and the, the very strange texture of this soil. So right here, it's not flowering, but you got, oh, there's one flower on there. It might be, I think it's one of those night flowering Nictaginaceae. Anyways, again, Nictaginaceae, the four o'clock family, which is uh, almost entirely new world, save for four or five species, mostly tropical. And this one, with these kind of succulent leaves, is the Aclyzanthes lanceolata. Aclyzanthes uh, has that other species, Aclyzanthes longiflora, in it with those long ass flowers, much longer than this, about four times longer than this pollinated by hawk moths at night. Again, like most other species in the uh, the Nictag family, in the Nictaginaceae, got those opposite leaves. These are actually quite beautiful, though. These are pretty glaucous. Glaucous and glabrous. And then you could just see there's, I mean, there's goddamn just gypsum boulders everywhere, just gypsum talus. That, uh, this one might be that Menzilia todiltoensis after the todilto formation which is a nearby geologic formation. In fact, I think it's the geologic formation we're on. Remember, Menzilia's in low associate of Velcro leaves. But this has very, uh, very narrow leaves. There's a the little seed capsules. A lot of diversity in Menzilia, too. Very, uh, very diverse Western North American genus. Oh, look at a gypsum. Such a lovely water-soluble rack. All those gypsum sands that uh, make up White Sands National Monument. The only reason it's there is because it's such a dry environment. Uh, the gypsum sands that would normally dissolve in water and just get washed away and be very short-lived uh, end up being there for a long time. You get dunes made out of them. You know, so everybody can go there and take their selfies and show how carefree they are and what this shit, you know. Isn't that nice? What's this, a lepidium? Ooh. Oh, yeah. Looks like a lepidium, Brassicaceae. Yeah, there you go. There's that uh, Aclyzanthes lanceolata. With a nice developing fruit on there. And fruits in this family are called an anthocarp. You yeah, look at how wing. Look, it's got the wings on it and everything. I think most Aclyzanthes have fruits like that. Winged fruits. It's technically in a keen, but this thing's just getting ready to go off. It's going to be going off tonight. See, look at this guy. Remember these flowers, these, these, uh, flower at night. Most of the Aclyzanthes. You know, Mirabilis longiflora does quite a few of the Nick Tags flower at night, pollinated by hawk moths. And this one specifically grows on gypsum. It's only known from gypsum, which, of course, is <laughs> readily abundant. God damn, I'm starting to really fall in love with this family. God damn it. They're fucking weird. They're so weird. It just takes seeing a couple cool genera. Abronia, Desert uh, Sand uh, Verbena is in that same uh, family. Bougainvillea is in that family too. Bougainvillea is just a tropical version of a nicktag. It's kind of a horticultural atrocity. It's planted too much, but whatever. You know? I'll get you some of that. Look at that nice, look at that nice Aclyzanthes. Nictaginaceae. Oh, look at that! Tequilia hispidesima, not tequila, tequilia. In a baraginaceae. A lot of goddamn tequilias that are uh, adapted to the gypsum. And that one's a gypsum endemic. Seen a bunch of those uh, borages that love the gypsum when I was down in uh, Nuevo Leon. Got a lot of gypsum down there. Must be a Chihuahua desert thing. I think the gypsum likes the Chihuahua desert. 
or maybe the Chihuahua Desert likes the gypsum, or maybe it's just a chance, uh, happenstance that the gypsum got uplifted in this part of the country due to a uplift that occurred, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 million years ago. No, nah, maybe not that. Like, maybe, it was, maybe it was more recent than that. I don't know. Let's see what we got going on over <laughs> Oh, yeah. Listen to that sound when I walk. Doesn't that sound nice? Kind of reminds me of walking on a... Jesus Christ, I don't know. Something crusty and hard. Listen to this. That's the ground. So that's the physical structure of the soil here. It's basically... Uh, it's got, the, you know, the composition of concrete. The texture of concrete, too. It's not very nice. It's very rough and abrasive. But apparently... This uh, other rare endemic that's known only from this region, and it, I think in particular from the area surrounding this white mesa of gypsum, uh, this is Tonsendia gypsophila, Asteraceae. Now, the Tonsendias are all basically these sespatose bastards. That is just the general, you know, matted thing going on. You know, no uh, inflorescences coming up, just primarily sespatose, rounded, matted, basal rosetta. That's not really a rosette, it's more just like a just a, a thick mat, but uh, either way, most species in the genus Tonsenia are like this. In fact, I believe they're all like this, and Tonsenia has quite a bit of diversity in western North America, mostly at higher elevations, you know, generally above four to 5,000 feet, and we are at about 5,200 feet right now, so we're a mile up, so it's not that hot, and it starts to cool off relatively earlier in the day, like 5 p.m. instead of 8, so it's not as miserable as the Sonoran Desert. Uh, regardless, this uh, plant, uh, this perennial plant, you know, comes back from a, a woody root uh, every, uh, I think the leaves might be, the leaves might be evergreen. I don't know if they're deciduous or not. But regardless, it's adapted to grow on this, uh, this toxic, I mean, it's not toxic, but it's got excess levels of calcium and sulf sulfur. And then also just the soil texture itself is a bastard, you know. It's really abrasive. It's really hard. I mean, how the hell is a seed gonna send a radical out into that how, how the hell is a germinating seed gonna send the root out into this kind of soil you know ideally it'd be a uh, spring or late winter and it'd be wet i guess you know but of course since it's gypsum it's water soluble the texture changes greatly once it's wet but uh you know right now it's just it's pretty incredible i mean how would water even get through this you know unless you get a heavy downpour how's this thing gonna get water water's just not gonna be able to penetrate through this thick crust. Look at that. It's just, it's a fucking... <laughs> and then just growing right there, you got that Tequilia, Boraginaceae. Everything growing kind of safe, but those and forming a mat. Tonsendia gypsophila. i seen Tonsendia. You get a couple in southeastern California in the desert mountains down there. You get them in southern Utah. It's a pretty successful genus, and they all do the same kind of thing, you know. And there's quite a few rare ones. There's one in Capitol Reef National Park that's pretty rare. It's got the uh, apricot-colored flowers. Yeah, I guess you could call it cute. It's cute. I wouldn't, you know, I don't necessarily know if it's a, uh, if cute is the word I would use. It makes me feel a lot better about the shit state of the world, though, when I look at it, doesn't it? Oh, look at that. Oh. This shit is this. Onathra harwegia? I think it is. Evening primrose family. Not a lot of stuff is blooming in the heat of the day. A lot of stuff is just closing up. This guy's getting ready to go off. You can see that. He's just prepping for tonight. A lot of those evening primroses. Obviously, evening, they bloom at night. Like I said, not much is going to be going off when it's 95 degrees outside. You can see those leaves are just so linear. Just so narrow, linear, reducing surface exposure to the sun, minimizing moisture loss. So again, in a gypsum habit, we see more evidence of the uh, power of adaptation and evolution in plants. Multiple different families all converging on the same traits and same morphological habits uh, to adapt to both the harsh chemistry of gypsum and uh, the harsh physical texture. I mean, again, it, that's, this has a consistency of dried concrete. You know, like someone did a really shitty concrete job, you know? Like, say, Vinny mixed a bad batch of cement, you know, and it was laying out a patio or some shit, just fucked it all up, you know? Maybe he's getting blazed before he comes to work. I don't know. Maybe he's a burgeoning alcoholic. Who knows? Either way, the texture of this soil is not very pleasant. 
to walk on or to germinate on. And then if, yeah, but of course everything changes once the temperatures cool off and it gets a little wet. Okay, so there we go. There's a nice Nick tag for you right there. Remember, Nick Taginaceae doesn't have any uh, corolla. That is, there's no petals. Everything's just sepals. So you have petaloid sepals. So each flower is just basically a tubular, uh, a tubular flower composed of only sepals, no corolla in there. And these aren't open yet, of course. There's the fruit or a cluster of fruits rather, each, each fruit has a single seed in it. So it's more like an akeen. See, there's one. Now, there's a bunch of them, a bunch of individuals that just fell off that cluster. And each one of those little uh, four-sided fruits just has one seed in it. And those things subtending, those aren't the, see those bricks? They're just bricks. They're not sepals. So it's a weird thing going on. A cluster of, cluster of flowers with petaloid sepals, no true petals, no corolla. It's pretty odd for a plant. And of course, uh, most of them, or a lot of them, blooming at night. Nice ridge up there. Huh? It's like a little reef. It's basically just an anticline, you know? Okay, now on the other side of the mesa, now it's a little bit later in the day. Temperatures are starting to cool off and the sun's a little bit lower in the sky. Stuff is finally starting to open up. Got a lot of good stuff going on here. Got this Facilia Savinskii. Also got this uh, Menzilia. Torilto. Maurice Menzilia Toriltoensis. So this was named after the, the uh, Todilto formation, which is uh, coincidentally the formation that this is on right here. Growing on pure gypsum. So Menzilia is a pretty widespread genus in Western North America. It's part of the Lois Aceae. Uh, and that family, of course, includes the genus Euchne, the rock nettles, some of which get uh, almost shrub size. You know, I've seen them down in Oaxaca, in Pueblo State, Mexico, growing on the sides of cliffs, a.k.a. the rock nettles, uh, you know, on the side of the road, and they're just enormous. They generally display the same kind of uh, morphological thing going on here, just dozens of stamens. You can get up in there and look at it. See, there's dozens of stamens right there. But this species of Menzilia, of course, is uh, adapted uh, to this harsh gypsum soil, which not a lot can grow on. Again, it's got the texture of uh, a shitty batch of concrete, and it's high in calcium and sulfur. And same thing with this Facilia, Savinskii. Facilia, of course, is in Baraginaceae. Used to be in Hydrophilaceae, but they merged it in the Baraginaceae. And now I think they might do another taxonomic uh, whip up and what the shit, and maybe move it back into Hydrophilaceae. I don't know. It gets ridiculous after some point. I think some, maybe some grad students just got to make a name for themselves. I don't know. Either way, pretty interesting plant. Heavily glandular. Covered in hairs. And of course, those Corollas are just, they're, they're tiny. They're tiny here. And of course, the Vasilias also uh, exude a lot of terpenes and uh, oils and what the shit. This one, it doesn't smell good. This one doesn't smell that good. I don't know how to describe it. Kind of chemically, kind of a, it's kind of a turnoff. I think it's to get, to prevent stuff from eating it. Which uh, it should have no problem doing because it kind of smells like hell. I mean like a pleasant hell. Like a, you know, like a plant terpene, but just a very strong one. And right there you can see that, especially the line where the gypsum starts. The sandstone ends right there. It's all just, you know, basically sandy soil, just sedimentary rock, sandstone, uh, slowly eroding away. And then the gypsum starts right there. And you get the more gypsiferous soils, which is what all this is. That's why there's nothing growing on it. And then, of course, down here we got my friend Eclysanthes lanceolata opening up for the day. Look at those salver form, uh, well, they're not Corollas because Nectaginaceae doesn't have petals, remember. It's got petaloid sepals, the whole family. And then, of course, the fruits right there, those little winged fruits, the anthocarps. 
is the cold. And these will bloom all night and then probably wrap up uh, tomorrow morning when the sun comes back out. See, these aren't even open yet. These are just getting ready to go. Oh, no, these are done. These are done. See that fruit maturing down there? These are done. These are opening. They just probably just opened within the last hour. And then they'll wrap up tomorrow by, uh, you know, by the time the sun gets on, it gets hot as shit again. See, those are done. They got a fruit right there. These are not done. They're just starting, so there's no fruit yet. The fruit's not maturing. Leaves are opposite, glabrous, almost look mildly succulent. And again, another plant that's just adapted to gypsum. I don't think you ever see this species of Eclysanthes growing off of gypsum. Eclysanthes is a goddamn wonderful genus. Nectagenaceae. I think most of them open at night, like I said, pollinated by moss. You know, who was Savinsky? Was he? I think he was... He was one of those, uh, he was a good Pollock. I knew him from down there on Archery Avenue on the southwest side. And then, uh, you know, he hit me with a tire iron once when we got in an argument over cards. But I forgave him. We became friends again, you know, years later. Then I heard his, his family moved to Berwyn because they got, you know, they got tired of the incredibly high Cook County tax rate. You know, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Let's walk up this uh, sketchy uh, gypsum um, hill right So it, it seems, at least in this case, in this area, in this region, that the, the plants that grow on gypsum don't grow on it necessarily because they need it, or they need the soil chemistry, or they need the harsh physical physical texture. They grow on it, namely because nothing else can really compete with them here. And were they to grow on other substrates, they would just easily and quickly be outcompeted by other plants. There's that facilia. So you can get some nice full frontal there. Got six uh, prominently exerted, actually maybe it's only five. It's only five prominently exerted stamens. The style's got to be in there somewhere. Oh, the style's coming out the bottom. See that little pink thing? Much shorter than the stamens. And look at all those hairs. The whole goddamn family, whether it's hydro hydrophilaceae or Braginaceae, all has those hairs. Sometimes they're glandular. Sometimes they got terpenes on them, oils and shit. And sometimes they're just uh, just hairy and irritating. Oh, there's the wind. And of course, you got the scorpioid sign. Vasily Savinsky. Savinsky I? Savinsky? Who was the Polak? What was his name? A nice dwarf oak. Quercus gambellii. Those rounded, those rounded lobes. See, if they were sharp, I wouldn't be saying it's Quercus gambellii, but since they're rounded, probably Quercus gambellii. Glabrous at axial surface. Pubescent thunderside. Pubescent at axial surface. Circle carpus again. Oh yeah, gypsum badlands. And then there we go. There's that Tonsendia again. Tonsendia gypsophila. So everything you see growing here is basically a gypsum endemic. You know, whether it's that Medzilia, whether it's that Tonsendia gypsophila, that Onathra harwegii might be a variety that's endemic to gypsum. Not sure I have to look that one up. Oh, you know what? I think that Artemisia is just a tower. It just it's not an endemic, it just is it's not restricted to gypsum, it just tolerates it. Oh yeah, and then you got that Eclysanthes, of course. Another gypsum endemic, Lanceolata. Oh, you got a circle carpus here. Apparently, circle carpus uh, can uh, tolerate gypsum too, but it's not an endemic. Anyway, another beautiful sunset. That's all I got for you tonight. Go fuck yourself. Bye.